in California right now, Michael Garza. So we're going to get him on the phone real quick and then pick things up. So using technology. We'll try this again. All right. Okay. So, all right. We got a pair of spray. And... Uh oh. It's very busy. Nine? One. Nine, then one. Okay, got it. <laughs> He's expecting a call. Yeah, yeah. That's why he's not. That's why he's not answering. Yeah. <laughs> Black triangle right now, but uh, I'm sure we can all picture you in our heads. So let's go ahead and get started then. All right. Thanks for joining us from afar, please. Hi, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you want to kind of start things off? Sure. Sure. Um, so uh, uh, maybe we'll start by um, by talking a little bit about what the project is tomorrow sure. tomorrow night. So uh, the South Omaha stories. Um, the idea for it uh, began a couple years ago when um, one of the evening activities here was, I think, called the Tapestries, the mm -hmm. South Omaha Tapestries. And um, all the people at the conference were brought down to South Omaha, and we watched as um, members of the communities shared their stories with us. So it was a mix of spoken word and um, some storytelling. There was some dance. There was some uh, music. Um, Etc. And it was a it was a cool evening, um, but the sharing was all sort of one way, right? Like we went and sort of received the stories, and then um, went and got a drink. And <laughs> and I um, and I emailed uh, Scott and Kevin and said that was really cool, and I wonder if there's a way that we could think about. Um, or it also struck me that we were all going to see these tapestries there and the other, the other evening events. But um, there wasn't much movement in the other direction, right, where, where, some, where we were able to invite the community to join us in what we were doing. And so I emailed them and I said, I wonder if there was a way for us to think about what it would mean to make something together or to, you know, also we've got these amazing dramatists who are converging um, and joining Omaha dramatists. And could we make something together? Could we figure out a way to bring our craft to meet their stories and uh, make something? And so cut to um, this year where we decided to, we, the South Omaha stories this year um, is a, uh, collage of um, of five different pieces um, written by these amazing writers, uh, Michael Garces, who's in um, California, and Kia and Ruth and Scott, and uh, a guy named Virgil, um, who's a local uh, storyteller. And um, we came out here in February and did um, some interviews with them. Uh, we met them in their home and spent a few hours with them and also had an opportunity to do a follow-up uh, meeting with them, mostly by phone, um, and do some talking about what, uh, what the piece, what sort of the aesthetic um, of the piece might be. And, uh, and then Michelle, um, Michelle Phillips, who uh, is a local director, worked with some local actors since for the last mm, three-ish weeks, something like that. Uh, putting the piece together, which you'll see tomorrow um, evening. So the piece itself is this blend of four different playwrights' voices and the voices of 
um, five uh, um, community members in Omaha. So uh, that's a little bit about the pieces, and I wondered if we might start maybe by talking a little bit about what um, what uh, your guys' previous experience has been with um, making uh, community-based theater, or not so much community theater, right, but theater that is actively trying to um, partner with the community in which it's situated. Um, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about Cornerstone, the work that you do out there? Michael? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. now we can. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, um, so I, um, I run a theater company in Los Angeles. I've been here for almost 10 years now uh, called Cornerstone Theater Company. And we are uh, an ensemble-based company. And our focus is, our mission is to, to create uh, works uh, in collaboration with uh, you know, a community. So we will uh, work with a given community defined sometimes by geography, either a neighborhood in an urban center or a small town, you know, sort of a confined geography of some kind or determined geography, um, or a community defined in other ways by faith, uh, job, uh, sometimes issues that a particular group of people are, are grappling with, uh, that kind of thing. And so we have a process by which we'll uh, be in residence uh, with the community over about a year and a half, two years, something like that. And our playwright will uh, engage in various different activities, one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, group activities that we call story circles. We have lots of exercises that sort of elicit story and, and conversation from people uh, and, you know, various other activities. And uh, over time, after sort of gathering uh, a critical mass, hopefully, of stories, uh, the playwright will write a play, generally a fiction, sometimes an adaptation of an existing text, sometimes a new play, uh, that is based on those stories and the voices and the, and the plates. And uh, we uh, uh, then go into the community and start, uh, uh, you know, gathering people together who might be interested in auditioning in the play, uh, uh, being in the play. And so we'll uh, then fully produce the play uh, with a combination of both professional actors uh, often from our ensemble and non-professionals uh, from the community in a full production. Um, so that's that's essentially what we do. I've been doing that work for, again, about 10 years. Uh, and prior to that, I've done some community-engaged work uh, in some other contexts as well that I can talk about later if you're interested. Great. Um, and what about the uh, the rest of you guys? Um, I, I mean, that's a very explicit way of engaging community in the creation of work. Um, what are the ways that you guys have created work with, uh, with community in mind? Um, well, I, I was thinking about the word community because I grew up in church and um, I remember two things that I learned in church were um, a prophet is without honor in his own country and that we should be in the world but not of it. And so I grew up thinking that, and, and so that's a kind of circle that I was in that was sort of cloistered off into churches and, and removed from the real world in a way. And so when I got out of that into the theater, <laughs> I think um, I discovered that there were a lot of other circles of downtown theater in New York, uptown theater, um, and then the, um, the world, uh, the larger world beyond America. And I think I've spent the last 10 years of my work really trying to travel outside of my world because I wanted to know this world that was missing from my upbringing. And I felt like I had to catch up with um, this huge blind spot that I had from my childhood. So I think I was, um, and also just by geography, I moved every three or four years up until the past um, eight years I've lived in Chicago. So that's been the longest that I've ever lived anywhere. And so I'm now starting to think about my neighborhood and my apartment and my neighbors and my the two churches that are nearby that maybe I could rehearse in, in that space. And, and I'm putting down some roots in Chicago as I can. And But I think that there are so many communities that I come in and out of that I think of as my community. Um, I think of my, I think of them as sisters um, at Da Theater in, in Belgrade, Serbia, and there are people that, of course, I don't live with, but that I have ha had a long-standing kinship with, and so um, I met them in 1996, and we are 
working on something new together, but we can't always be together. You know, we're not always in the room together, so when we are, we have to really have a depth of time and, and space that we spend, and I think that's a really deep relationship that isn't contingent on geography and is often hampered by geography, but um, is, has become a very important part of my community. And I think also of my, um, my artistic brother, Fred Ho, who has been a collaborator um, until he passed away last year. Um, Jose Figueroa is another brother that now lives in uh, Minneapolis and is a martial artist. Um, and I think of Kia as my sister, even though we're n often not in the same city. So I think that there is a community that, um, that dwells in me, and I am of that, but I'm not necessarily always in the room with it. But I do think it's also important to do this kind of work that we're doing here, which is, um, I think, in my mind, similar to what's called artistic exchange. <laughs> mm -hmm. As you travel, there are some grants that are like artistic exchange grants. And I think of this project in that way because we are sharing, the, our collaborators are sharing, and we're trying to exchange ideas and methods and um, styles and learn from each other. So mm -hmm. you try to be as, as open as possible, but you hope it's not that one-way kind mm -hmm. of street. Have you guys made theater that um, uh, where you have had to journey into a community that's not your own as the basis of some of the content of the work? Does that make sense as a question? Written about a community that's not your own, what you <laughs> think of as your own community? or Well, actually, most of my work is not necessarily about my own community because mm -hmm. I... Uh, every single play, depending on what political issue I address, could be a completely mm -hmm. different community. Um, I've, I've never done anything exactly like this before with uh, that sort of really interesting direct collaboration. Mm -hmm. I did years ago, uh, I did a play of mine that was already written about uh, women in prison. And we did it, a small theater in New York, uh, uh, and off off Broadway wanted to do it at this space, the Point, which is a community center in the Bronx. It's a very black Lat and Latino neighborhood, and um, it was actually great. We did like three or four performances, and it was completely sold out, meaning really reservationed out, because it was completely free tickets. But um, but it was cool because the audience all was there because they wanted to be it wasn't a subscription audience where they paid for the ticket and now they were going to see what you know was was on the subscription you know the mm -hmm. the roster and so uh everybody was really eager actually one of my favorite moments was um there was a part where i uh, there were this these teenage boys who came a second time uh some of the actors were telling me about this and i uh, because i sort of saw them in the corner but they they stood in the back because it was so packed that it was, uh, I guess it was some, like some standing room. And halfway through the, <laughs> halfway through the play, uh, two of the women who were cellmates kissed. And then the boys were completely satisfied. They saw that again, and then they left. They didn't either see the rest of the play. <laughs> they just came back to see that again. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but that wasn't like this because it wasn't created. That play was already written, but it uh, felt, there was something about putting, there was much more of a community participation. And half mm -hmm. of the actors uh, were, or the, I should say the principal actors were professionals in New York, and the mm -hmm. others were of the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. And Scott, are, what, are, um, uh, what are the ways that you've either investigated community or invited community into um, either the piece itself or the process, either as an artist or in terms of your work at MCC or at the at the festival here. Well, it was uh, it was really interesting for me because uh, you know not only did I, I interview Lucy and uh, you know worked on her piece, but I was able to help Virgil kind of dramaturg um, his his thing. Um, uh, Virgil Armendariz, he was a part of the. Uh, uh, 2013 show that we did and he was just a really charming guy and uh, actually Kevin suggested that we bring him on because we did want to have one actual voice from the community uh, to represent you know we've got these great artists coming to visit and so we wanted uh, an Omaha playwright but then also someone from that community to speak in their own voice um, and it was great engaging with him I, I basically just kind of gave him 
um, like essay assignments and kind of asked him questions to help explore his imagination and uh, really see where he was coming from and things like that. I actually live in South Omaha now. It's, uh, I definitely call it home and it is, you know, one of the, you know, more diverse, bustling kind of neighborhoods in town. Got a lot of history. Um, so I really feel a part of it that way. And another thing, great thing about Metro is that, you know, as a community college, there are a lot of non-traditional students that come here with incredible stories of their own, backgrounds, you know, a lot of veterans, a lot of people with second and third careers. Um, and in playwriting class, uh, it's great to have them kind of find their voice as well. And uh, that's one thing I, I enjoy is just like helping other people kind of facilitate finding their voice, uh, saying what they have to say, and, and helping them share it in a sense. Um, so yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the nature of the community work that I've mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. mainly in, mm -hmm. in the last, last few years or mm -hmm. so. Great. And Michael, um, I wonder if you might speak to what you think is important about this kind of work, um, what the goals are of this kind of work, either for Cornerstone or when you've approached this kind of work in your freelance career. Um, and, and what you think, um, the, what's necessary about this kind of work as opposed to sort of how we traditionally think of the way that theater approaches questions of audience? Well, uh, you, know, I, you know, first of all, I'd emphasize that this work is, uh, I mean, there's a long and strong tradition of this kind of work, uh, uh, both in the United States and, and elsewhere, just in general, in making theater. I mean, theater is essentially people coming together to tell their stories in, in various different ways. And, and in the context of even professional American theater, there's a long tradition of professionals and non-professionals working together. Um, so I, I think there are some conventions in how we think about profession, professional theater. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, this isn't sort of, in, in essence, something new, although there's a, there, there are new perspectives on it. Um, I think it's important because as, as, as certainly as theater makers and certainly myself speaking individually, I, I, I'm really, I'm most excited when I make theater that feels really uh, immediate and alive in the room and elicits uh, a strong response to the sort of aesthetic event in the audience and that there's like a high level of participation in that, in that, in that, uh, in that interaction. So people aren't simply sitting back and looking at something uh, but really uh, engaged with it in a strong way, and I think doing work like this uh, gives you uh, or maximizes some of the potential, not the only way, but a way to maximize that potential for immediacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that really exciting as an artist. Um, I think it's also important because, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of theaters are struggling with, you know, diminishing audiences and trying to figure out how to remain relevant and, you know, what's going to get people, too much people to come see the show. and uh, the, the shows that they're making. And I think when we talk about community engagement, we're simply talking about making work that, you know, that deeply engages people, that makes them want to see it, that, that, that uh, it, you know, that, that allows the artist to make work that is going to speak to an audience. And so um, I think this kind of work is one way to address this question, and I think it's an exciting uh, way to do it. And so that's, that's, but that, that's primarily what my uh, interest is, and, and certainly as a person and as a citizen and human being, it also gives you a chance to sort of engage with big issues, issues that are impacting a group of people in the present in a way that is deep and allows you to kind of step outside yourself and really uh, channel other people's perspectives mm -hmm. as well. And how, for, for any of you guys, in terms of either this process that we engaged in or um, other work that ha that is sort of community engaged, how have you navigated, or how do you navigate questions of hierarchy and insiderness versus outsiderness um, with everything from uh, you know theater literacy and how we're sort of trained to understand the work itself to um, the interpersonal interactions and et cetera. I think there's a, um, <clears throat> a kind of aesthetics that um, you can share in degrees. Um, and I'm thinking of a Project 7 that was a little bit similar to how we worked on this in the sense that there were seven female playwrights and we interviewed women world leaders and wrote monologues and then wove them into a play and it's called Seven. Um, and I remember early on 
I was trying to be really um, close to the verbatim way that Farida Azizi, who was my uh, interviewee, the way that she spoke, the way that she told the stories, and yet also bring my aesthetics um, into this monologue I was writing, and then we all seven had to you know, work on it as a play and put our aesthetics together. And, and it was in intensely challenging to have seven aesthetics in the room and then the aesthetics of the storyteller and to remain true to the way that the story was told. And an example was um, that one of the very first readings we had at New Dramatist, one of the dramaturgs said, to me, um, well, I don't really know if the Taliban is good or bad. Sometimes it's good in this in this monologue, and sometimes it's bad. I, and I said, but I'm not changing that. That's how Farida told the story, and the Taliban was at times helping her bring medicine to women who couldn't have a regular childbirth, and at times threatening to kill her. So I wasn't going to change that, but for the sake of the dramaturgy of the understanding of the audience. It was important to me that that stayed true to how uh, Farida told the story because that was her experience. And the same with the Mujahideen in the story. Her brother was converted to be a Mujahideen and, and yet later they were fighting, you know. So, um, so I think it's very important politically even to be careful about your own aesthetic dramaturgy in these kind of projects where you're working with somebody else, somebody else's story and um, so there's a very fine line that you kind of just navigate instinctually mm -hmm. and maybe with um, a lot of feedback from the person whose story it is. And, and uh, we, we were hoping to have more feedback actually mm -hmm. with the people that we worked with, but we ran out of time and so, um, but that can still happen. You know, we can still in tomorrow night, we can talk with I can talk with Dorothy and see if she's got more suggestions and thoughts and that kind of thing. So it's not as if it's ever over. And I think of this project as the very first, or not the first step, but one of many steps between the hierarchies of Omaha theater and this conference where all of us kind of parachute in and, and then there are other people that are living and making work here and how can we sit down at a table together and talk together and work mm -hmm. together and um, that's when you really start to see artistic exchange because if it's this sort of like, if you can cut down on the parachuting <laughs> somehow, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really um, talk together, spend time and really listen very deeply. Mm -hmm. What was your experience of, of um, creating trust with the interviewees either in that face-to-face -face weekend or uh, in the time between then and, and now? Well, it was, uh, it was kind of interesting for me. Lucy, uh, you know, she's had a really full life and uh, over the course of uh, our conversation, it got very, very personal. Um, uh, discussions with, uh, about her mother and father, uh, about their border crossing, uh, her hopes and dreams and things like that. And, uh, she felt comfortable enough. Uh, there was just like four of us there at the time, and it was very conversational. And uh, just to try to kind of maintain that, there were definitely some some details that I didn't feel were necessary uh, to to share, out of respect for her mother, uh, who I'm sure will be there tomorrow night. Um, but still get a sense of the struggle that she went through and the person that she became. Um, and uh, yeah, and then with uh, with Virgil, since he was kind of telling his own stories, and uh, these are stories that he's t told a million times to a million different people. Um, and uh, so with him, it was a lot easier. Uh, he just kind of needed to open up a little bit. Uh, he's kind of a shy guy, not much of a public speaker unless you put him in a corner. But when I talked to him <laughs> about this project, he said that you know he views things that he hasn't done as a challenge. So he just really rose to it. And, and then when I said, well, would you mind being in it too? And uh, he once again he just stepped up to it. So, um, so that was that was just kind of my take on it. There were there were aspects that I was I was honored that she shared with me, but I didn't necessarily feel like Omaha needed to know some of those details. I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I guess 
uh, I was about to say that I was very fortunate because with Tula, who's a senior in high school, she must be about to graduate, uh, admittedly was very talkative, <laughs> and so she's a great interview. But then again, I guess uh, for all of us, who whoever volunteered to be a part of this project was ready mm -hmm. to be open in some mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. So I guess in some ways, uh, there were somebody that were that were open to be trust mm -hmm. trusting. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was so uh, yeah, that mm -hmm. was helpful. Great. Um, you start. You touched on this, Ruth, just now. I'm curious um, how you guys navigated. Um, the tension between wanting to be truthful to the lives that you were that you were to portray, with a finding something that felt like it had uh, dramatic conflict or um, uh, uh, you know that felt dramaturgically like uh, what you wanted the piece to do, and also navigating their voice, right? Wanting to be authentic to how to their voice, and also creating a piece of art that feels like your voice. And Michael, feel free to jump in there as well with your thoughts. Well, I guess uh, to start off, I mean, it was really interesting when we all started seeing each other's other's pieces. Um, the the last few projects I've worked on have been a, with uh, found text, basically. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I condensed some Edgar Allan Poe uh, into four 15-minute readers' theater pieces. Um, and uh, then shortly after that, with a, a class here at school, we did kind of a, a bio collage theater piece uh, about Jackson Pollock. Uh, and in that, I mean, we even used um, a, bill, a bill of sale became a monologue in that piece. So in that tradition, I, I, I pretty much stuck <clears throat> really close to um, Lucy's words. I just kind of created um, an environment in which she could speak for herself um, and just kind of went that way and just because a lot of the, the details of her life have like little moments and things so I was I, I stayed pretty close to that luckily we had them all transcribed which was really nice um, uh, recorded and transcribed so that was um, just kind of my approach I mean I was pretty faithful to that but I still feel like since that's how I've been creating plays in the last few years, it felt just like the right way for me to approach it. But it was, it was fascinating to see th all the different styles, though, too. I mean, this was uh, probably, I, I would say it's my voice, but differently stylistically than I usually write. Um, there are plays of mine that maybe once in a while uh, maybe once a character may come out and address the audience. In rare instances, I've done that. Whereas this, it's a lot of a direct address. She talks to the audience, then she's in the scene. She talks to the audience, then she's in the scene. And uh, so she's a storyteller, and she's of the story back and forth at the same time, which is very challenging for the actor, actually. But uh, uh, so, so, uh, so that stylistically was different. Um, and I, thankfully for the uh, transcripts, was I uh, was using a lot, uh, so I could be reminded of her voice. And also, we had recordings, so I could be reminded of that. And so, because uh, it was really important to me, I used her words when I could, and other times when I felt it was more efficient to uh, fiddle with them, I, I would do that. But it's it's definitely I prioritized uh, Batula's voice over my own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> um, that prioritizing is is important in a project like this. But it's also interesting as as you guys were talking, I was realizing that. Um, when I worked with Fred Ho, uh, we would co-write often, and um, when I first started working with him, he let me write the first draft, and then the second one, he wrote the music first, and, and so, but in a way, um, we're always co-writing. We're co-writing with the audience, we're co-writing with our collaborators, we're, even when we're just writing a play, we're sort of co-writing in a way, so there are different levels of that. Um, but the, um, 
I was thinking about how I've, I've tried to kind of train myself to withhold myself and my aesthetics in teaching um, because I think it's important to enter my students' work with their aesthetics and to try to read it from within their aesthetics. And so there's a, a certain amount of denying of my aesthetics that I've worked on as, as a, <laughs> an artist, and it's not easy. Um, but I think that um, the draft that I brought into a little writing group that I have in, in Chicago, and uh, a, draft of this. a draft of this piece, um, a colleague of mine at the School of the Art Institute is a filmmaker, and he's in my writing group, and, and he really chastised me for my draft. And I told him it's in a material stage, you know, I'm, I'm still getting a sense of its own inter inner workings and everything. And he said some kind of harsh criticism. <laughs> and it was interesting because I haven't really been getting a lot of feedback as a, as at this part of my career. There's not a lot of you know feedback coming at me sometimes at early on. And so it was humbling and I was really mad. His name is Chris Sullivan, I'll call him out there. <laughs> but he's a really respectful, I, I really respect his art. So I thought about it and then I went back and rewrote it two more times and I think that it was better for me. He really was telling me to step up my aesthetics. And so I did that in the second and third draft. And, and now I feel like I'm at a place uh, when we go to rehearsal tonight where I've also got to step back a little bit because we only have a certain amount of time and there are some aesthetic choices that I might change if I had time and, and yet I've got to make it just, I've got to step back again because it, I could overstep um, my bounds of the process and the process has only, like there's only so many notes you can take at a certain amount of time and so, so I stepped forward and now I'm stepping back. So <laughs> well, there's a little bit of, to and fro. Michael, anything you want to add about navigating your voice and Joe's voice, or your um, aesthetic or uh, artistic agenda with um, with the material that you had? Well, I think the uh, the the task, the the situation is always really complicated uh, for a writer. Um, when I wrote uh, the first piece that I wrote for Cornerstone, I had I was lucky to. Uh, early on in that process, I uh, spent some time with Allison Carey, who's one of the founders of Cornerstone and writer in her own right. And uh, at one point, she just looked at me and said, look, you have, because you, you're, you're filled with a sense of responsibility and to the person's story and the person's voice and honoring them and all that. It, it, it can be a little bit paralyzing it can, or it can inhibit. And she was like, you got to let all that go. You just got to write your play. You know, you have to trust yourself that they shared with you and, and, and you sort of brought their expertise and their experience and their community to the table and now you have to bring your expertise to the writer to bear in your in your, in your artistry and just kind of just write your play and um so whenever i get assignment at this point i try to come on that um and um and so uh um that's uh you know that for me is having a challenge and uh, i'm sorry i'm getting an incoming call here so i'm ignoring um, and uh, you know, and, and then for me, what I find always challenging is how to create, how to, how to, how to find the drama, you know, how to find what makes it, what makes it play, essentially, uh, because a lot of times the stories you hear are are beautiful and they're very detailed and specific, but they aren't necessarily dramatic. Um, and so for me, uh, always trying to find that event or, or where the conflict is, essentially. Uh, in a way that is respectful, and that was that was the challenge of this piece, as it, as it often has been in the past for me. Great. Well, I'm curious if there are any questions from you guys, or also to hear if any of you guys have your own experiences with creating work in collaboration with specific communities, or. Um, strategies that you guys have employed to invite community into your work, either in terms of process or the product itself. And once again, uh, come on down to the mic if you have it too, so we can <laughs> record it for uh, HowlAround as well. So uh, my name is Howard Emanuel. Uh, my play Sundogs is going up uh, on the main stage on Saturday morning. And uh, it's, it's about a, a, 
uh, Iraq vets uh, and uh, returning to Kuwait. And uh, based on the death of a friend in Afghanistan is what sort of sparked it. Um, and uh, another uh, fellow from, from my area um, is, is deeply in the play as well. Um, and I sort of dream of finding a, a, a place of production for, for the play where the veteran community can come in and experience it. And um, you know, where it isn't just sort of read by a, a not-for-profit is great for not-for-profits are and saying, you know, whatever. That, that I wrote the play as a ritual of healing of this group of people and to then allow the theatrical experience to become that um, you, and, and, and I'm sort of desperately searching for a way. So all of this is to say that I haven't created with the community. Uh, I've spoken to uh, Glenn Stuyvesant's mom about, about the play uh, to whom it's dedicated and, and you know, in that regard, um, and that was a very fine line of what you know, she wanted what she would allow, and I sort of had to step back and, and say, okay, it's not about him, it is about the, the event and, and the attempt to move forward. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so it, it's a difficult balance, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't have an answer of mm -hmm. how, you know, you sitting at home, at home alone writing can then get it to the people who you feel mm -hmm. uh, need to, to consume mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, you've, what you've created. Mm -hmm. so, that's, that's what I have. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? I would say I think communities can be initiated. You mm. know, there, there's a um, uh, guy named Naveen Kish Kishore in Calcutta who started a group called PeaceWorks right in 2002, right after the riots in uh, Gujarat. And he just said he felt that he couldn't go on um, as an artist as a Hindu artist um, without making this new um, community, which is called PeaceWorks, and it continues to this day. So he, he felt you know, this burning urge to do something and to take an action, and I think communities are started from those kind of actions, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like, and sometimes they just, they grow naturally out of things, but I think sometimes somebody starts them and they, they find their way, you know, to find each other. Great. Great. Well, okay. Oh, got one. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Again, another great topic. Every I feel like I'm coming up here every um, every lunchtime. Um, but it all speaks to me. And uh, so last year I had a play produced in L.A. called The Magnificent Dunbar Hotel, and. <coughs> It's about a, a hotel that um, was a primary social and uh, place in mu for music and everything in L.A. during the 1930s and 40s. And uh, it had uh, the history of it, without getting too long-winded, basically it had fell into uh, decay and um, was just renovated and built to look like it did back in the 1930s. So part of my research in, in, in writing this piece was I, had, I was looking to find people who were there during that time. And I, I wasn't that successful with that. Um, it's, you know, so many people died, you know, it's a long time ago. I, I did find a couple of people, and it, it, it was, um, well, it was very informational. But, but what happened, though, was that when the play went up, the turnout was tremendous because of what the hotel meant to the community at that time. So even though a lot of the people who were there were no longer there, their descendants were still in LA. So the grandchildren and, and the children came because their parents had been part of this magnificent Dunbar Hotel. 
And, and one of the most amazing things that happened for me was during the course of the run, I think I told you about it, Scott, there was a woman that came, she was 98 years old, and um, she had worked at the Dunbar as a cigarette girl when she was 17 to 23. And, um, and, and afterwards, someone asked her, well, what did you think? Did you like it? She said, no, honey, I didn't like it. I loved it. <laughs> and and, and um, and she said, I, I just wish you would have talked to me because I could have given you some more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, this whole thing about I, I, this theater and the connection to the community, it, it, I, I, it, it's so important. You know, I was talking to someone else about this earlier today in terms of, of how it resonates on levels that we, we don't even get. I personally think that like the lack of having theater that is representative of what's going on, political theater, whatever, is, is really kind of, you, you could say it's partly responsible for the climate that we're in today. You know, th this climate uh, that we're in is, you know, if we, if we had more theaters bringing people together and dealing with the issues that we're dealing with, then maybe some of these shootings and all this stuff wouldn't be happening. I, I, that's just my belief. Mm -hmm. in Thank you. Cool. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Um, thanks for, for sharing your thoughts. And, you know, it, it, just one last thing in closing. It makes me think of the way that, um, uh, you know, so often I think we have the experience in theater of um, preaching to the choir, you know, or, or the theater is being made by the same people that it's being sort of performed for and, and in dialogue with. And so I know for me in, in working on this, it's been, really, um, it's been really useful to think about other strategies of trying to speak to and with and make work with um, other voices, right? Mm -hmm. Different voices than my own. So thanks for that experience. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Bye, Michael.